Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me back here for another episode of Crime and Wine. My name is Ariana, or to the YouTube fam, you guys can call me Ari, and I cover true crime cases, sometimes true crime stories that have inspired the making of movies, so I like to switch it up a bit. But again, thank you for any of my new subscribers and any of you guys that have been watching my videos. Thank you so much. Today, we're going to be talking about a very interesting case that was headline news for quite a while, which was the Idaho college murder case. Um, this is a very sad and unfortunate case, but there's so many details to unravel about this case, so I'm excited to get into it with you guys today. Also, if you see my cute little boba squishmallow here, I love boba, and so yeah, little fun fact about me, but anyways, let's get into today's case, so grab your glass of wine, and let's get into it. <gasps> On November 12, 2022, four Idaho college students were slaughtered to death in a quadruple homicide that took place in their very own home off campus. Madison Mogan, age 21, Kaylee Consalves, age 21, Zaina Kernoodle, age 20, and Ethan Chapin, age 20, were murdered in the early hours of November 12, 2022, in their house located just minutes off campus of Idaho University on King Row. Around 2 a.m., Madison, who also went by Maddie and her best friend Kelly, took a rideshare from one of their usual rideshare drivers and arrived at home around 1 o'clock in the morning. Earlier that night, a Twitch recording from the food truck tracked them there getting food and hanging out together having a good time before walking out of sight to catch that rideshare. Zaina and her boyfriend Ethan were also home together in the early hours at this time as well after attending a house party earlier that night. So first off, to get a better understanding of the timeline of the events of when the killing took place, we can take a look at the layout of the, of the home and this in itself is pretty interesting but before I get into that let me explain that from all the research I've done although there has been many different things on this somewhat less of an important detail um, I believe that there were just four girls that were tenants of the home that actually lived in the home which was Dylan Mortensen, Bethany Funk, Kaylee Consalves, and Zaina Kernel. From my understanding, Madison, or aka Maddie Mogan, was previously a roommate, but had recently moved out and had been back in town that specific weekend, and Zayna's boyfriend, Ethan Chapin, was also there that night, but he was just staying the night with his girlfriend, Zayna, so he did not live there. The home in which they lived in was three stories, and from many floor plans that I looked at of the home, it seemed like a very big home with lots of rooms, mainly because this was a shared rental space, specifically for college students, so many people from the local college had lived in that home over the years. So on the first floor of the home, which could possibly be more of the basement of the home, was where Bethany's room was located and depending on the article that you might read the details of where which roommate stayed in what part of the house changes slightly but to keep things simplified with the less important details of the case we'll stick with Bethany's room being on the first floor and then the second floor which seemed to be more so the main floor of the house since this was where the living room and kitchen and and balcony of the home was located. Um, this is where Zaina and Dylan's rooms were and they were located across from each other. And then lastly, the third floor is where Kaylee and previously Maddie's bedroom had been. The interesting aspect about this case is that there was a partial witness, which was the roommate Dylan Mortensen, who would later tell the police that she had gone to sleep in her bedroom on the second floor of the three-floor home and was woken up around four in the morning by what sounded like Kaylee playing with her dog in one of the third-floor bedrooms. A short time after the roommate said, she heard someone that she thought was Kaylee say something to the effect of there's someone here the document said but that could have been Kaylee on her phone because records showed she was on TikTok at about 4 12 a.m the affidavit said the roommate said that she looked out of her bedroom but she didn't see anything and when she heard the comment about someone being in the house the document said she opened her door a second time 
when she heard what she thought was crying coming from Kaylee's room. The roommate then said that she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you, according to the documents. When she opened her door for the third time, minutes later, she said she saw, quote, a figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. As she stood in a, quote, frozen shock phase, she said the man who she did not recognize walked past her and headed towards the back sliding glass door of the home. She then locked herself in the room and it would be eight hours later at 11.58 a.m. when the first call to 911 would be placed from one of the surviving roommate's cell phones who reported an quote, unconscious individual. So of course these two roommates and especially Dylan had received tons of hate on social media and I can probably assume even at school to an extent because people blamed them for not calling the police right when all that happened because again the first call to 911 was placed eight hours later and this was after Dylan she said herself she saw an unidentified man in black clothing walk right past her and she got so scared she closed the door and locked herself in her bedroom but again guys i have went through so many articles and i've watched many different videos about this case and there are so many little details of the case that are a little different from each other so i'm just giving you guys everything that i know a couple articles I read said that apparently the roommates had summoned friends to the house because they believed that one of the victims on the second floor had passed out and was not waking up. Um, multiple people supposedly spoke with the 911 dispatcher before officers arrived. This is what the police said. And also on social media, many have expressed disbelief that um, Mortison and Funk would not have woken up during the killings. However, there was a former first floor tenant named Ryan Augusta and he would tell Fox News that he typically heard nothing from the second and third floors when he lived there in 2019. So who killed Maddie, Kaylee, Zena, and Ethan? When it came to figuring out who the killer was, this was an incredibly difficult decision, mainly because their home that was located on King Row was known as a college party house. The whole area was very well known to have lots of parties, just being that lots of students lived in that area off campus from Idaho University. In fact, this specific house though, had the cops called on them several times for noise complaints, which police body camera could even recall those interactions specifically with one time Maddie speaking to the police about abiding by the warnings that they were receiving. So, how hey are guys. you? Good, how are you? Good, is this your place? Yeah. Perfect, you are here. Uh, and I assume noise. Noise, yeah. Yeah. Are you right there? Yeah. Nothing against having a party. Once neighbors start calling in, they have an issue. Fair. Uh, you go to school? Uh, yeah. Okay, what year? Senior. Senior, okay. So I'll tell you the same thing I told them. You probably know the drill, right? Actually, no. Oh, okay. So, usually, at least for me, I'll give you a verbal warning. Okay. Uh, once I have neighbors calling in, your music's too loud, you're disturbing the peace. Yeah. Nothing against having parties, nothing against having people over who are overage to drink. Mm -hmm. But again, once we start disturbing the neighbors, then we've got an issue. Yeah. Hello, miss. Hello. What's your name? Zana. Zana, do you live here? Yes. Hey, did Megan talk to you earlier? I, no. Okay, does Megan live here? Megan, I do not have a Megan that lives Megan here. Mogan? Maddie oh, Mogan, uh, yeah. Madison Mogan, yeah. Madison Mogan, okay. She does Sorry, live here. Sorry, we. She is at the club. She's 21. I'm just going to bed. I have a couple friends over, but okay. this is my idea. Did, have you talked to Maddie tonight? Yes, I have. Oh. She's at the cl corner club. Okay. Did she Did she tell you anything about anything that happened earlier or anything like that? Honestly, not really. <clears throat> I'm. I've just been here. The past. Hour. Okay. Okay. Just trying to go to bed right okay. now. I mean, I I understand you guys. Mm -hmm. You're coming here. I'm I'm just going. To bed. Okay. Well, understand that you're responsible for the residents. Okay. So whoever else is here, if they have a safe way to get home, you need to kick them out okay. or tell them to come inside and be quiet. Okay. Because the houses that are on this hill all the way around here, we can hear you from 
clear down the road when we were coming up here. We could hear the music, okay. and that's I'm so sorry. Where we're past sorry. the point of having polite conversations, okay? Because yeah. so neighbors sorry. are being kept up. Okay. So the amount of people that were in and out of the house was a lot. So it had all kinds of DNA in the house already. Um, but detectives looked at every single possible thing that could be evidence. Remember, when there's so many people coming in and out of the house for these parties, not only is it all the DNA from every person that had ever stepped foot in the house, but also imagine the amount of DNA you bring in from the outside. So that house from head to toe was just covered with so many different people's DNA. So these police and investigators really had to focus in on everything and every little thing just to find something that would be of evidence related to this killing. So first off, not that this is evidence, but the police said that Kelly's dog Murphy was found safe but in her room the night of the killing and that Maddie and Kelly had been sleeping in the same bedroom and in the same bed in Maddie's room, but no evidence was found on the dog. At about 4.17 a.m., a sec security camera less than 50 feet from Kernoodle's room picked up sounds of a barking dog and, quote, distorted audio of what sounded like voices or a whimper, followed by a loud thud, according to the documents. They also found surveillance footage from what showed to be a white car identified by investigators as a Hyundai Elantra passing by their house multiple times. At around 3.29 a.m., it passed the house at least three times, and the fourth time it stopped at the house at 4.04 and came back after making a U-turn, and then at 4.20 a.m., it drove out of the neighborhood rapidly. This was incredibly suspicious, primarily because the victims of the house were located on a dead-end street. So now at this time, investigators wanted to track down this Elantra for questioning. And simultaneously, investigators at the crime scene found a knife sheath with a U.S. Marine Corps logo lying on the bed next to Maddie's body. This knife sheath, or rather the covering to the knife, was specifically a K-bar knife, which is known to be a very powerful knife. And now that they pretty much knew what the murder weapon was, the challenge was not only going to be finding the murder weapon, but also, or at least, finding who the knife belonged to. Investigators did, however, realize that the little buckle on that knife holder had a very clear and apparent DNA, but it had not matched with anyone in law enforcement databases. While looking for the suspicious Elantra and figuring out who exactly that knife sheath belonged to, they began to rule out every person that they possibly could. The two surviving roommates were ruled out as suspects, all of the girls' boyfriends were ruled out as suspects at the time as well. The police at the nearby Washington State University found a white Elantra registered there and they identified the owner of that specific vehicle as Mr. Koberger. We can assume that he was brought in for questioning as a possible suspect but without any DNA to tie him to the crime. They had really had to just hone in on this man in order to rule him out or to continue with their investigation against him. Investigators had sent the knife sheath with the DNA on it for further analysis and this eventually produced a more extensive profile that enabled the use of genetic genealogy through consumer DNA samples to build a family tree. And by December 19th, FBI agents had begun focusing on Mr. Koberger's timeline of events the night of the murder. Police said that they traced the car's travel that night back to Pullman, Washington, where Koberger lived. Koberger's phone was tracked headed to Moscow before the attack, but the phone was off from 2.47 a.m. to 4.48 a.m., which, quote, is consistent with Koberger attempting to conceal his location during the quadruple homicide, the affidavit said. He also returned to the area of the house where the four students were killed just after 9 a.m., which would have been about five hours after the murders, based on the phone records and the affidavit also showed. His phone was near the victim's house at least 12 times before the murders, at least as far back as 
August, according to the affidavit. So we can assume that Mr. Koberger or Brian Koberger, he must have been stalking these girls, this house, this group of friends for months at least, at least a dozen times, which I would probably assume went on a lot longer than that. And then he must have been maybe planning this for a while um, and then decided to commit that awful crime that night. It's just terrifying. And then because the cops weren't called till eight hours later after the killing happened, he had that time to go back to the crime scene, whether it was just him driving by it or what, but five hours after the the crime was committed, he drove back, and so, I don't know, it's pretty crazy. So who was Brian Koberger? As a teenager, Mr. Koberger wrote online about his struggles with dissociation, suicidal thoughts, a lack of emotion, and minimal remorse. And in 2018, he described to a friend a nearly lifelong struggle with depression, but said he was doing well and had stopped using the heroin that he had turned to when he felt suicidal. He later developed an interest in criminals, telling one of his friends that he saw himself one day working with high-profile offenders. He enrolled at DeSales University, which was a Catholic institution in Center Valley, Pennsylvania, where he studied in part under Catherine Ramslin, a forensic psychologist whose books include The Mind of a Murderer and How to Catch a Killer. He received a bachelor's degree from DeSales in 2020 and completed a master's degree in June of 2022. Last year in a post on Reddit, a user who identified himself as Brian Koberger asked people who had spent time in prison to take a survey about their crimes. The survey listed Mr. Koberger as a student investigator working with two professors at DeSales and it asked respondents to describe their quotes, thoughts, emotions, and actions from the beginning to the end of the crime commission process. In the fall semester of 2022, Brian began studying at Washington State for his PhD, which was about a 10 minute drive from the University of Idaho. The affidavit revealed that he applied for an internship in the fall of 2022 with the Pullman Police Department and wrote in an essay how he had an interest in assisting rural law enforcement agencies with how to better collect and analyze technological data in public safety operations. In the days before the killings, one classmate recalled that Brian had been highly engaged in a discussion about forensics, DNA, and other evidence that prosecutors use to win convictions. In the days after the killings, records show that he was still grading papers in his job as a teaching assistant. Koberger was stopped by Indiana police on December 15th for traffic violations. After Brian's semester at Washington State ended in December, he and his father were driving across the country together in the white Hyundai Elantra, heading to the family's Pennsylvania home for the holidays. How you doing? How y'all doing today? Good, good. Take a look at your driver's license real quick if I could. See, he's right up on that van, man right up on the back end of that van. So you're coming from Washington State University? Yeah. And you're going where? Uh, oh. We're going to be going to Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're a little, we're slightly much because we're driving for hours. Authorities said DNA from the suspect was recovered on a knife sheath left on the victim's bed, according to the documents. And on December 27th, police recovered trash from Brian's parents' house in Pennsylvania, and a lab determined the DNA from the trash belonged to the father of the person who left DNA on the knife sheath, that the affidavit said. So, Brian Koberger was arrested on December 30th in 2022 in Pennsylvania, which was about 2,500 miles from the Idaho campus, and he was charged with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of felon burglary, and he was then flown back to Idaho. 
Brian's trial was originally scheduled to start in October of last year, but he waived his right to a speedy trial in August, which indefinitely delayed the proceedings. He has denied any involvement in the murders, and a judge entered a not guilty plea on Brian's behalf earlier this year. Latah County Prosecutor Bill Thompson previously said that he plans to seek the death penalty, and public defenders representing Brian objected in a court filing in August to the state's initial motion to compel him to provide an alibi for the nights of the student's murders. In that document, quote, Mr. Koberger is not claiming to be at a specific location at a specific time at this time, there is not a specific witness to say precisely where Mr. Koberger was at each moment of the hours between late night November 12th of 2022 and early morning November 13th of 2022. The defense wrote in their August filing, his attorney said Koberger took a drive by himself that night and quote, has a long has had a long habit of going on night drives alone. As for evidence that they brought into the trial, there was actually a lot of items that they seized from a search warrant on Brian's apartment. The 15 items included hairs, receipts, a computer tower, a disposable glove, and items with peculiar stains. In the search warrant record, Investigators list several items with stains, including cuttings of a mattress cover, a reddish brown stain on an uncovered pillow, and a collection of dark red spots. Dr. Monte Miller, a former crime scene investigator and forensic expert, and former FBI agent Jennifer Coffin-Dafer, told The Independent that investigators most likely believed those items had blood stains. Quote, a reddish or brown stain is a euphemism for we found something that looks like blood, Dr. Miller said at this time. Quote, it might be blood from the victims, might be his blood, they don't know until they test it, but they'll be able to get DNA if it is blood. We don't know what the stains in the cover sheets look like, but again, they're looking for any kind of DNA, evidence that might have come from the crime scene. Ms. Coffin-Dafer added, they don't call it blood, but it's definitely inferred that it was blood. Court documents released by Washington authorities on May 4th showed that multiple items taken from Brian's apartment in Pullman had been tested for the presence of blood. While most items came back negative, two unspecified items were positive. Another item included on the list of seizures was a possible animal hair strand. And while Brian is not believed to have had a pet, one of his victims he is accused of killing, Kelly, had a dog. And if you guys remember, we mentioned this dog, Murphy, earlier. So. The dog was home at the time of the murders and was later found by police responding to the scene. The possible animal hair, they'll try to connect that to the dog left at the scene, according to Dr. Miller. If there's a root on that, if there is any skin on that hair, they could do a DNA test with that dog. If it's just a hair that's been shed and there is no skin, they would still be able to do a microscopical comparison and exclude most dogs, but they wouldn't be able to connect it necessarily to that specific dog. As of right now, the Latah County prosecutors filed a request for Brian Koberger's trial to be held in the summer of this year, 2024, in order for it to not interfere with the local high school that is across the street from the court. Remember guys, this is a very high profile case. So they wanted to wait for the summer of this year to have this trial so that, because they know that a lot of media coverage is gonna be at the courthouse. A lot of people are going to be there uh, covering this trial case, possibly protesters. There's just gonna be a lot going on. Um, so they don't want that to interfere with the high school, with it being dangerous for the students, pedestrians, um, nothing like that. So that's why they're trying to push for the trial to begin this summer. We really don't know why these victims were targeted. There have been some theories that maybe his main target was Maddie, 
since she, it later came out that she was the only one out of the friend group that he was following on social media, and it's speculated that maybe the other victims were killed as collateral damage, but right now, we really don't know. I'm not sure if we'll ever get a confession from Brian or any anything of why he he did this, but yeah. As for the victims, they each had a huge impact on their community and were definitely taken away from us much too soon. Madison Mogan, who went by Maddie, was a senior from Coeur d'Alene who was majoring in marketing. Her grandmother, Kim Chilly, said Maddie had always been a gentle and caring person who kept many long-term friendships and close ties with an extended family. Miss Mogan's boyfriend, Jake Schreiger, said she had been excited for graduation next year and had talked about wanting to explore other parts of the world. Maddie was always the one to spread positivity and brought acts of kindness to others, Mr. Schreiger said, adding that he hoped people would remember her for the love she had given to others. And Maddie's father, Ben Mogan, said he did not believe that anyone who had a personal relationship with Maddie or her friends would be involved in killing them. He said, quote, if you knew them, then you loved them. Kaylee Consalves, who was from Rathdrum, Idaho, had been set to graduate early in December and had planned to move to Austin, Texas with one of her close friends in June. The friend, Jordan Quesnell, said that she had secured a position with the marketing firm and was excited to explore more of the country. She said, we wanted that adventure. I would be like, let's do, let's go do this. And she'd be like, down. <laughs> Olivia Consalves, Miss Consalves' older sister, said that Kaylee and Maddie had served as bridesmaids for her wedding. And her father, Mr. Consalves, told how the two absolutely beautiful young women first met in sixth grade and became inseparable. He said, quote, they just found each other and every day they did homework together. They came to our house together. They shared everything, he said at the time. And he said, then they started looking at colleges. They came here together. They eventually get into the same apartment together. And in the end, they died together in the same room in the same bed. Ethan Chapman from Conway, Washington, was one of a set of triplets and had spent much of November 12th, the day before the killings, with both of his siblings, who are also University of Idaho students. And their mother, Stacy, said in the evening that they all attended a dance held by his sister, Sorority, and she said, my kids are very thankful that it was time well spent with him. She also said that he was literally the life of the party, he made everybody laugh, and he was just the kindest person. They said that he played basketball in high school and was known by friends and family members for always having a big smile ever since he was a baby. She described her son as, quote, just the brightest light. Zaina Kernoodle grew up in Idaho, but had spent time in Arizona in recent years. According to an interview that her father, Jeffrey, gave to an Arizona TV station. Mr. Kernoodle told the station that his daughter was strong-willed and had enjoyed having an independent life in college. He said that his daughter had apparently tried to fight her attacker and an account backed up by the coroner. Mr. Carnoodle expressed shock that his daughter could have been killed while at home with her friends. He says she was with her friends all the time. He also said that Zaina and her boyfriend Ethan were juniors at the college and had begun dating months before their deaths. The couple of 20-year-olds is believed to have been awake at the time the stabbings were carried out. Six months after the stabbings, the families of the slain students accepted their college awards for their achievements on behalf of them. Mogan and Consalvis rel relatives walked across the stage for their degree in an emotional ceremony on May 13th, and Kernoodle's family also accepted her certificate in marketing at a separate ceremony, while Chapin's award in sports, recreation, and management was mailed to his parents. On November 30th of 2022, a vigil was held at the University of Idaho in honor of the victims, with some family members in attendance. On December 28th, 
The King Road house was demolished despite objections from two of the victim's families who said that it should have remained standing for trial in the event that it would help understand what happened. But the Latah County prosecutors told the University of Idaho in an email from December 22nd that, quote, the current condition of the premises is so substantially different than at the time of the homicides that a jury view would not be authorized. Well, guys, that's it for today's case. Thank you so much for joining me here for another episode of Crime and Wine. We will come back to this case possibly later this year when the trial begins. Um, follow me on Instagram. I do have a Crime and Wine Instagram page now. It's called Crime and Wine by Ari. I will link it below. Um, if you guys would like to go and follow me on that page, I give some weekly updates on some of the latest news that's out in the headlines um i love to connect with everybody um every one of my followers through my stories and get to know you um so definitely follow me there if you haven't subscribed yet it would mean so much to me if you like and subscribe and i will see